Wellness Force Radio. Feelings are essential, but they can't dictate our actions. We literally infect each other with our emotions. We came here for a special purpose. Let the purpose unveil itself. Knowing without doing the same thing as not knowing. They're not just trackers. I'm going to wear this and it's going to help me do the right thing. Wellness Force Radio, episode 100, celebrating 100 shows. We're the best of the best podcast by spotlighting nine world-class wellness influencers and giving away thousands of dollars in wellness prize packs. Welcome back to another episode, my friend. I am your host, Josh Trent. Thank you for spending your time with me here on the podcast. This is where every week I'm bringing you access to global experts in all things wellness, behavior change, and new technologies. On this podcast, you'll learn from exceptional people who are dedicating their lives to being a positive force for our physical and emotional wellness. My intention with the show is that together we'll discover the connections between our emotions and healthy habits to live our best life and enjoy the process. This episode is brought to you by Perfect Supplements, a company I'm stoked to partner with who actually walks the talk with their values of non-GMO, pesticide-free, real food supplements that fuel us for the wellness journey. Head on over to perfectsupplements.com slash wellnessforce, enter code wellnessforce to save 10% off your entire order. My friend, we have arrived. This is it. Episode 100 of Wellness Force Radio on this ultra special episode. I'm going to do more of what I love to do the most. I get to share the voices of people I support and believe in today. And I get to give away over $2,000 in prizes as a thank you to you, the Wellness Force community, to celebrate our first 100 shows together. And on top of that, this is going to be an incredible best of the best podcast where I'm giving you an audio journey with the nine top leaders in our wellness world sure to leave you with inspiration and some tactical real life tools and ideas to support more wellness in your life. Stay tuned in just a couple minutes to see how you can win one of the five following prize packages you can choose from. Our first pack is the Knowledge Pack. This is a prize pack all about clarity. It's filled with books to help you plan your best and most inspired actions for the rest of the year. This Wellness Force approved book pack is six of the best-selling authors shipped right to your home, including Dr. Jade Tita and the Metabolic Effect Diet, David Zappazzotti, Immovable Heart, Unstoppable Mind, Melissa Hartwig, Food Freedom Forever, Bonnie Kelly, True to Your Core, Craig Ballantyne, The Perfect Day Formula, and John Lee Dumas, the Freedom Journal. Our next prize pack is the Health Pack. This is the ultimate wellness bundle from our show sponsor, Perfect Supplements, an incredible pack including Rhodiola Rosea to elevate mood and calm stress, a bottle of Prescript Assist prebiotic and probiotic for your gut health, Our third prize pack is the energy pack. Now this is where you get more energy in your cells and music in your ears, including a 30-day supply of Organifi green juice and a pair of 66 audio Revolution Bluetooth 4.1 headphones, sure to make your workouts more enjoyable. Our fourth pack is the mindfulness pack. This is kind of like my favorite. This is built to get you on track with your meditation and reduce your stress, including a brand new Muse brain sensing headband. This will take out the guesswork for your meditation and allow you to stay consistent with your practice. A lot of free guides in there as well. Really incredible tool for meditation. Also included in the mindfulness prize pack is a Spire breath and activity tracker that captures your breathing patterns and makes them meaningful and actionable so you can get the reminder to take a deep breath just at the right moment in your day. Our grand prize pack, this is the transformation pack. This is for jumpstarting wherever you are in your wellness journey. You get a wellness force coaching package, including four one-on-one coaching sessions with me, 30 days of unlimited access to my email, lifetime access to the wellness force Android or iPhone virtual coaching app. This includes private messaging where you can ask me questions directly through the app anywhere on the go right from your phone and lifetime access to the Wellness Force video library with over 100 bodyweight exercises you can do anywhere you are. Okay, that was a lot of free stuff. Hang on just one minute. I wanna tell you how you could win right from your phone. But first, in this episode, I know you've been listening to Wellness Force for a while, or even if you've been with us since the beginning, you know by now from this show that great things that we work on tend to take time and effort, and sometimes the hardest thing of them all, trusting the process, especially when it comes to our wellness. So in that light, today on the show, I'm guiding you through nine of some of my favorite moments over the past hundred shows to extract just the gems that I've learned to both believe and trust in. To be at episode 100 today is a huge benchmark in so many ways. This entrepreneurial journey and podcast path has not been 100% rainbows. 
to launch this podcast and have it grow, I've had to get out of my own way and face some inner and outer demons I wouldn't wish on anyone. But since 2011, when I started to wake up, I've done some really, really hard work to let go of old stories about genetics, beliefs, and people and things that just honestly don't serve my wellness. Even as hard as this has been, I've also learned that when you operate from a place of love and real service to others, and if you really want something, all the universe conspires in helping you to achieve it. It's true for me because since early childhood, I've known deep down that I marched to the beat of a different drummer, and I've always been curious for more. Maybe you feel that way too about your wellness, and that's why you're here using Wellness Force Radio, this podcast, for a tool of your life's work. Well, I've had the joy of having this podcast be my home, my work, and my life now for almost two years, and today I get to give that joy and thanks to you. Okay, here's how to enter to win one of the five prize packs. All you have to do is leave us a five-star review on iTunes right from your phone. You'll be automatically entered to win the prize pack of your choice. You can also click to wellnessforce.com slash 100. That's wellnessforce.com slash 100 if you're on the computer. Full details and rules on the show page at wellnessforce.com slash 100. You can also click to leave a review super easy right now from your phone by just tapping on the show artwork on your screen and touching the link that says review at the top in caps in purple. That'll take you right to the review screen on your iPhone. And after you hit send, that's it. You're entered to pick one of the five prize packs that you choose. Just a heads up, after you hit send on that review screen, your review actually won't show up in iTunes for 24 hours, but you will be entered to win. Any questions on how to enter, you can watch a 30 second quick video over at wellnessforce.com 100. Winners will be chosen at random by computer and your iTunes username will be announced on March 14th right from the Wellness Force Facebook page. So make sure you like our page on Facebook. Turn on the notifications tab to claim your prize pack March 14th. Now, let's jump into this special show and a notion of gratitude I have for you because you've trusted me with your valuable time and wellness and I can see it when I close my eyes in my mind. Together this year, 2017, we are growing this community with this podcast and with technology to touch the emotions and change the behaviors for greater wellness in a million people. First up is my good friend and best-selling author of A Movable Heart, Unstoppable Mind, David Zappazotti. In this first clip, we're talking about why wellness and achievement really live in two different worlds. After a 20-plus year history in health and wellness, David believes there is just one universal reason that blocks most people from letting go of their old weight. Let's hear what that is right now with David and be sure to download episode 72 for the full show. You mentioned in the book that you had this period of your own physical and kind of relational and emotional, and even it sounds like business, things weren't working. Can you tell us a little bit about that? It's funny because when you were talking about getting frustrated with having your clients have success, I had the same thing. And what I realized is that the way that I was trying to work with my clients And the way that I was running my business, the source of my frustration was the same as their source of frustration. I wasn't getting to the root of the problem with my clients, which means I wasn't running my business in the way that would be effective. What I came to realize, let me take a step back before I get into the business and and tell you something I realized that led me to write write this book. Mm -hmm. In early 2013, I was in my front yard meditating and I had gone through years of working with clients and, you know, trying to help people that were stuck and frustrated and trying to figure out what it is, what is it really that, that is the key to helping people. And in early 2013, I was meditating in my front yard and it was like, I found the keys. I realized what I had been looking for the whole time after I stepped back and just became quiet. And it was so simple that I just wasn't seeing it. And what I realized, the source, there's one reason why we get frustrated and stuck with our goals. And that one simple reason proliferates out, it grows out and creates all the complexities that we experience. And that one thing is a fixation on achievement. So what I mean by that is when I say achieve, I mean to try to get something that we don't have now, to obtain, to grab a hold of something that we want to get that we don't have at this point. And what I realized about that is that that's a problem to look at our goals that way, because when we look at it that way, it actually creates a separation from us and our goals. It creates a a separation between us and our goals. And it projects it into the future. And because it's in the future, that doesn't feel good on an emotional level. And so 
emotions attract more emotions that are like them. So what ends up happening is because we see our goal as separate from where we are, we don't have it. It's in the future and it keeps staying in the future. That doesn't feel good. So then we pr- bring on practices that also don't feel good. So then that's why when a person follows a nutrition program, the first thing they think of doing is cutting out foods. What do I need to eliminate? What, how do I need to restrict myself? Mm-hmm. What do I need to limit? That doesn't feel good. Okay. When we exercise a lot, I see a lot of people at the gym, they're exercising on the treadmill, reading a magazine or watching TV because they're bored and they don't want to do it. That doesn't work. That's not effective for long-term success. So what I realized is that the goal actually isn't separate from us. We have to reverse that process and bring it back to within ourselves. So what I used to do with people is I would take them through a process. So let's say a person wanted to lose 40 pounds. I'd ask them, okay, why do you want to lose 40 pounds? Why is that important to you? Well, I want to be able to play with my kids outside. Like that's just one. I'll just give you this example. I want to be able to play with my kids outside and feel like I can do things with them in that way. Okay. Well, why is that important? Well, if I could do that, I feel like a, it was more connected with them, you know, and why is that important for you? And I keep moving down the layers. And here's what I found is whenever I did this with, I've done this for many years with a lot of people in every case, as we move down the layers, it always came down to an emotion. People don't want to lose weight for the sake of losing weight. And the thought of losing weight doesn't excite anyone. What excites them is the ways that their life will change with the blossoming of that goal. So people don't want to lose weight for the sake of weight loss itself. They want to lose weight because they want to feel more empowered, more fulfilled, more of a sense of joy. And what we realize when we see that, when we can really see it, we realize that it's important to take practices on a daily basis that reinforce what I call those goal emotions that joy, that fulfillment, that empowerment. And the more that we can take pra- take action in those ways that reinforce those goals and emotions, the more success we're going to be able to have, long-term success with our goals. And I wasn't doing that with my business. My goal, my goals with my business were all about achieving something that I didn't have. So I did a lot of things that felt restricting, that felt limiting, and it was a grind. And eventually, I felt like I got burned out. By the time we closed the doors, we closed the doors because we had to financially because of the economy. But to be honest with you, I was a little bit relieved. It was a struggle for a lot of years for me. You'd closed your emotional doors, yeah. Yeah, you know, I just got burned out on it. it it's, it's the same thing as when a person follows a nutrition program and they decide, all right, I'm done. I, I can't do this anymore. And they shouldn't do it anymore. If it feels restricting and it feels limiting, they should. They need to take a different approach. And what I talk about in my book and what I talk about with people that I work with is that you can still have the same goal of like weight loss or whatever, and you can still even take the same actions, but because you're seeing it differently, you're able to take those actions in a different way and they're able to have a different effect than they normally would. Michael Strasner is one of the most respected leading experts in personal transformation, and he taught me in person how to open my heart in the advanced emotional intelligence and leadership course that changed my compass forever. This was a really emotional episode for me as Michael's teachings taught me to connect with my father after two years of not speaking and let go of some old weight I'd been carrying around for years. In this clip, Michael is talking with us about the difference between our feelings and emotions and commitment to self, how we can harness the energy to guide us towards wellness without letting our emotions hold us back. Let's drop in with Michael and be sure to download episode 27 for the full show. So would you say that having a clear vision and having a clear purpose in life is essentially refracting energy from emotional presence? I mean, do the two go hand in hand or is emotional presence completely separate from having a clear vision? Well, I think emotional presence um, can be connected to vision. But I think if, I, if my vision is driven by um, my emotions, then it's going to be a, you know, going back to the roller coaster analogy, it's going to be hot and cold, up and down and inconsistent. When I think of a vision and I think of a purpose in life, then I'm so clear about this, whatever this is, this declaration of of the life I want and the future that I want, that I'm committed to it. And when I'm committed to something, it doesn't matter how I feel. Feelings are irrelevant. Now, I'm not saying it doesn't matter how I feel. I'm saying that that feelings can't dictate my action in life. If feelings dictate my action in life, then when I'm hot and I feel good about myself, I'm going to go to the gym. Who doesn't want to work out when they feel good about themselves? Everybody. Who doesn't want to eat healthy when they're happy and they're empowered and they feel good about themselves? 
Everybody. Who wants a pizza? Who wants the couch? Who wants bonbons? Who wants you know to sit around and 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 uh, not take care of themselves? The unhappy person, or the unmotivated person, or the insecure person, or the sad person. And so what I'm saying is, is that feelings are essential, but they can't dictate our actions and our behaviors in life, or we're going to have erratic and inconsistent results. If I'm vision driven, then what what is present there is the distinction of commitment. The distinction of living my word. And when I'm committed, I think of a mother, for example, uh, you know, a mother who's got a child uh, that they're that they're carrying in their womb for nine months. Does it matter if she is happy, sad or or feeling good or or nauseous or uh, having energy? Uh, for most of those mothers, it doesn't matter. She's having that baby. It's a non-negotiation. There is no way out. My baby and I are are one, and we are having this baby no matter how I feel moment to moment. So the mm. commitment is there. And she might be nauseous. I mean, I remember, you know, nausea for my wife when she was uh, pregnant. I mean, she was nauseous for four months. I mean, couldn't keep anything down, could barely eat. A couple of times we had to take her uh, to the emergency room to, to get hydrated because she couldn't keep anything down. And I'm looking at her going, oh my gosh, thank God I'm not having a baby. I don't know if I could do it. I have so much respect for moms. So much yeah. respect. Yeah. I mean, and that's what I'm saying. And, and it's in the respect for me comes from that incredible commitment. When I think of commitment, I think of that that it doesn't matter what I go through. Think of the body changes a woman goes through. You know, maybe she's, uh, you know, 112 pounds before she gets pregnant and she loves her physical body and she worked on her, her health for, for her whole life. And now she's 25 years old and, and weighs 160 pounds and she's pregnant. I mean, it's not just the physical uh, aspects that, uh, that, we go, that they go through of being pregnant and carrying a baby. It's also the changes in their body. And how that affects their maybe their self esteem, their confidence, their emotional state, uh, their joy, their happiness, their love of themselves. But I can tell you right now that the commitment is there, and and that level of commitment. Imagine if we had that same level of commitment regarding our vision in life. So, do feelings matter? Absolutely. Do we want to feel joy and happiness and, and empowerment and inspiration on a daily basis? Yes, of course we do. Nobody wants to walk around with sadness or, or insecurity or anger or pain. But, but those feelings cannot be bigger than the vision and the commitment to make that vision real. The next clip is with a powerful speaker, health entrepreneur, and the co-founder of Quest Nutrition and the host of Impact Theory, Tom Bilyeu. In this segment, Tom is talking about the promises we keep to ourselves and why. How his mission now with Impact Theory spearheads a movement to facilitate mental transformation, both through its empowering content and by accelerating businesses and entrepreneurs destined to change the world. Tom wants to free people from the matrix. Said another way, he wants to end the poverty of poor mindset. Tom dives into what the no BS answer is that will help us end metabolic disease and how understanding mythology and rituals can empower us in our wellness journey. Let's listen in with Tom now and be sure to download episode 98 for the full show. You make promises to yourself and you keep them. And there was a promise you made years ago. You, you wrote in your side, I went from dead broke, in debt, not able to pay my bills to building that billion dollar brand. What was the promise? I mean, all of us make promises. Sometimes we keep them, sometimes we don't. But what was that promise? Like, why was that such a heavy promise that you wanted to keep? Yeah, for me, it, man, you really have one shot at this. Like, this is your one go round. And to really go introspective and ask, what is the purpose of all of this? And for me, the answer was to acquire as many skills as possible to have utility and then put that utility to the test. And so really recognizing once you realize that you can do anything you set your mind to, how you spend your time becomes a spiritual consideration. And so when that switch flipped in my mind and I realized that I was capable of all of this stuff, that I wasn't stupid, or at least I didn't have to be stupid forever, um, that I could learn, I could expand my intelligence, I could expand my ability to execute, then it, it became a question of, okay, well, what are you going to execute against? Like, what are you trying to bring to the world? And 
wanting to put that at the core of my life is really about answering the question, how far can I take myself? And that to me is the meaning of life. Like the very meaning of life to me is that concept of skill acquisition and seeing how much of your potential you can actuate. Um, I think so many people are satisfied merely to have potential instead of actually do something with it. So I hold myself to a standard of execution and that's the metric by which I judge success. Looking back, thinking about all the things that happened up to founding Quest, you went through quite a bit of turmoil founding Quest. Why did you leave Quest? So I consider myself to be the chief evangelist of Quest. Um, I'm in a founder role now, so I don't have a day-to-day role. The reason that I wanted to do that is because I believe that wellness is really a 360 degree endeavor. It's not just the body, it's the mind as well. And originally had thought, you know, hey, we'll do all of this inside Quest, which is actually why we were doing the show. I wanted to really get back to the employees, do something great for them. And then we opened it up to the world at large and thought, okay, this will be the way that we increase the scope of what the brand is. Um, but the reality is that brands are are very difficult to encompass multiple things. And people come to a brand for a specific thing We'd obviously just crushed it on the food angle. People really got it. They understood it. That's what we were about. And so trying to get the brand to encompass the mind as well just was running the risk of that being a little schizophrenic. But I really, really believed that it was important to encompass the mind. I believe that we're living through two pandemics right now. You've got the pandemic of the body, and that's what Quest is meant to address. Then you have the pandemic of the mind, and the leading cause of death among young men in America is suicide. And depression and anxiety are ubiquitous. I mean, it's really, really crazy. And so that's the pandemic of the mind and wanting to address that and asking myself the same questions that we had asked about Quest, which is what is the no BS answer to ending metabolic disease? And the truth was that you had to make food that people chose based on taste and it happened to be good for them. And so wanting to do the same thing for the mind, which is what do you really have to do to pull people out of that vicious cycle, you know, of being depressed, of being anxious, of feeling trapped in your life, not being able to accomplish the way that you want, not understanding or being able to find fulfillment. Like really, really, what do you do to address that problem? And I firmly believe that it's going to be addressed through commerce, that it has to be a self-sustaining engine. It can't be a philanthropy, which is always coming to the world with your hand out. So how do we turn that into a self-sustaining engine, which turned me back to the thing that I had really been thinking about for a long time, and it certainly had the biggest impact on my life, which is mythology. And I think one of the biggest problems that we face in society is a lack of rituals that are driven by the myths. And they've really become toothless. And, um, you know, I've talked a lot publicly about um, why I got scarred as a part of my wedding ceremony, not the ceremony itself, but as a part of my transition to being married um, and just hearkening back to when rituals were more intense and they had more of a, you know, a kick in the ass. When you you say scarred, what do you mean scarred? I mean, what was that process? Yeah, so I read a book called The Power of Myth, and it talked a lot about different rituals. And one of the rituals it talked about was ritualistic scarification, which a lot of tribes use to remind themselves either a ritual of adulthood or whatever. It's always some transitional moment. And they you know, would get branded or they would get tattooed or whatever the case may be just to remind themselves that they were different the day before than the day after. Mm. So um, I was somebody who was terrified of needles, absolutely did not ever want to get a tattoo. And so I thought, okay, that's one of my greatest fears Uh, I'm going to face that. I'm going to get a permanent reminder that I'm a different person before and after this ceremony. So I got tattooed, which I don't think of it as being tattooed. I remind myself that it was a ritualistic scarification and I treated it as such as something that was very ceremonial, sacred, and a permanent reminder of the change and transition and Uh, My wife and I are about to celebrate our 15-year anniversary, uh, so it's worked so far. Our next guest is going to take you to the basement for some cleaning, in a good way, though. Bonnie Kelly, author, speaker, certified coach, and my good friend, returns to Wellness Force Radio to talk about her new book, True to Your Core. How we perceive, interrupt, and experience reality is definitely unique to all of us, like a thumbprint. Bonnie is talking to us about why neurologically we're an endangered species, She is an expert in personal development and helping people heal from their past. In this short clip, she's explaining the science and real talk about how our brain chemistry is just like a computer. And like any computer, it can be reprogrammed with inspired action. From upgrading some conscious beliefs to what it takes to write a new story, Bonnie is giving us the clarity and the insights on why we do what we do. Be sure to download episode 87 for the full show. I read your book in one sitting. 
I have a book filled with highlighter. I have 30 pages of notes, but we're only going to have time for 10, but they're going to be a really powerful 10. This book touched me in a very, very unique way. I actually was reading the book and I was thinking to myself, why did I not read this before? Because I had flashbacks with my parents. I had ways that I'm going to grow. I had assignments that I completed. So let's talk about your book right up front. You know, this true to your core. Why did you name it true to your core? And then we'll get into some science. Yeah. So, um, it's because like these beliefs, a lot of, a lot of what we believe is locked in our subconscious mind. And those beliefs are installed, um, more often than not in our childhood. And what happens is that when they lock into your subconscious, that they go unchallenged and undetected, then they become part of your identity. And it starts playing out as a thread in a common theme throughout your entire adult life without your conscious awareness of where it came from or why you believe it. Mm. And it's so so true, it's true to your core. And that's why we titled the book that. Mm, so it's something that's branded. And the analogy you make many times in the book is around a computer. You know, something yeah. interesting came up for me. I'm realizing not only from your work, but from a lot of people we've had on the show, we are all programmed with old wiring. So we're mm-hmm. cavemen and cave women in this modern world. And I feel like it's an issue because as you state in your book, the subconscious mind controls 80% of what we do on a daily basis. Does that mean there's only 20% that we're conscious of, Bonnie? <laughs> well, you can expand that, but yeah. And actually, in, interesting enough, I actually heard, I was talking to a, um, another scientist uh, not too long ago, and he was actually saying that now the new studies that are coming out are showing that it's about 90% of what your subconscious mind controls. Oh my gosh. And if you think about this, right, because um, a lot of people are like, going to have a hard time really understanding what that is. And I love that you brought up this computer analogy. So what we reference in the book is that, you know, your computer, you know, has got two main components. So you have the, the desk monitor and then you have the tower. Well, they both depended on each other to work, you know, uh, together to really be able to transmit information for you to be able to see and to, uh, you know, to, to understand. But the tower has all the programs stored. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of your subconscious and your conscious. And the subconscious mind is where you're going to have all of this information from your history about who you think you are, how you show up to the world and what you think, uh, how you fit into it. All of that, you know, got programmed into the mind, you know, when we were in our developmental stages. And a lot of that is still operating. And some of it, you know, and some of it, and most of us have viruses that got installed on accident that are now wreaking havoc in our adult lives. And I really want people to let that sit for a moment because this analogy, this metaphor of our mind, the computer, you know, Bonnie, the definition of computer is an electronic device for storing and processing processing data, typically in binary form and according to instructions given to it. There's also a secondary definition, and this one hit home. This is a person who makes calculations, especially with a calculating machine. So as we're kids, are we calculating? Yes. Oh my gosh. That's like, I'm totally stealing that, Josh. That is amazing. (laughs) (laughs) That is fantastic. But yes, when we're children, we're just like sponges, right? We are absorbing information. We're trying to understand ourselves, but our brains are kind of working against us a little bit. Like we, we lack this ability to be able to separate things from ourselves. We don't have this concept of perception or perspective. So everything that we're experiencing kind of is taken personal, right? It's like happening because of us. Like when mommy and daddy go through a bad divorce, like it's because we weren't enough or mm. we didn't do it right. When we experience trauma, whether it was, you know, some kind of physical violence, sexual violence of any sort, you know, a lot of times, especially in our, in our pre-adolescence, you know, we accept that as our fault. You know, even when you're the victim, you'll blame yourself. I should have known better. I, I, I was old enough to do something. And so you, you accept all of this stuff and it doesn't get challenged. And so it just kind of soaks into the subconscious and the subconscious says, okay, this is what I believe to be true. And then it just kind of just runs on autopilot in the background and it's influencing a lot of how we think and how we feel in our conscious reality. Um, and a good example of this, right, when we talk about how powerful the subconscious, if you just evaluate your day, right? Like, I mean, you know, it's morning for me right now in California and whatever time you guys are listening to this, really stop for a moment and think about your day. Did you have to really know how to make yourself breakfast, how to get dressed, how to tie your shoes, how to drive your car? Like all of these tasks that are mundane, you're able to do them and think of other things. You're able to do them without even really focus or concentration. 
The reason why that is possible is because at some point in our lives, we have trained, we have installed a program into the subconscious that says, this is how you do this task. And we do it on auto, on autopilot, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you get jo uh, uh, dressed, Josh, that was a tongue twister for me. <laughs> <laughs> You probably put your right leg in first all the time on automatic without even thinking about it, right? Like that is just how you've taught yourself to do that habit. And, you know, so if we ever decide to change these things, we really have to put a lot of attention and focus into concentrating to say, okay, left leg first, left leg first. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have a way to remind yourself and you don't have a way to sort of hijack the brain, then you'll just automatically default, put the right leg in and not think about it and move on. Well, those are fine for constructive pro programs, but it's when we get these destructive ones saying that I'm not enough, I'm not worthy, I'm unlovable, I'm a failure, I'm weak. Now, if that got programmed, that still exists and is infecting your relationships, your decisions, your success, your finances, your, your everything. Yeah. And that's what, you know, we wrote the book to get people to say like, wake up, let's do something about this. Nir Ayal is a best-selling author, speaker, and behavior change Jedi master that is educating people on how to build the sometimes challenging healthy habits we need to thrive in this technologically modern world. We have buzzing from apps, devices, and notifications pulling us away from our personal connections and conversations. Well, Nir is teaching us about what he's come to know as the hook model. This is how companies create behaviors with tech that can benefit their users or turn them into addicts depending on their intentions. In this clip, Nir pulls pulls back the curtain for a look behind how companies use psychology to capture our attention, including triggers, actions, variable rewards, and investment. Once we know how they do it, we can then consciously choose where we put our attention and avoid being disconnected from the relationships we care about. We can use technology to give us wellness rather than take it away. You can hear Nir's full story and mission downloaded on episode 48. I wrote the book and I started blogging about what I was learning and, and then all of a sudden I started getting phone calls, I started getting emails, I started getting booked for speaking engagements and all of a sudden I found myself busy to the extent that I couldn't stay focused on the things I really wanted to pay attention to. So this is kind of the, the curse of doing well is that all of a sudden uh, what made you successful, in my case research and writing, I didn't have time for anymore. Hmm. So it was constantly emailing and keeping up with my social media accounts and making sure that something that I wrote was properly promoted on Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn. And, you know, all of these technologies were kind of uh, ramming themselves into my life at my hand, of course, but in a way that wasn't really serving me. And so that's when I started to, to kind of realize, wait, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I don't feel better. I kind of started feeling l less connected to people in my life. I, I had less time for friends. I had less time to be present with my, my wife and my beautiful child. And uh, so what I wanted to do was to figure out, hey, how do, I, how do I break these unhealthy habits? And it turned out that the same exact model that I describe in the book uh, that relates to how companies like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and WhatsApp how these companies create habit-forming products is actually the same exact model that we can use to break unhealthy habits. So the, the model is called the hook model. It's this four-step process, and we can go into more depth around the four-step process. But the important thing is that we can use that exact same four steps of trigger, action, reward, and investment to break unhealthy habits in our life. Uh, by removing the triggers, by making the action more difficult, by uh, delaying rewards, and by not investing, and we can go into further depth on those four things. Turns out it was the exact same mechanism uh, that I used to break those unhealthy habits. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited to talk about that too. One of the things that I noticed you do is you have word associations to help people remember. And this easy to remember hook model is Atari. All engines have four parts, and you described it as the trigger phase, the action phase, the variable reward, and the investment phase. Let's go through one by one. I don't want to give away your whole book, but maybe just dive into first what the trigger phase is and how you came up with this model. Sure, absolutely. So Atari, A-T-A-R-I, so A hook stands for a trigger is the first step, an action, a reward, and an investment. Uh, the first step of the hook is this trigger phase. And remember, the context for all this is to understand how products can form habits in our lives. So whether it's email or iPhone or Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, all of these products at their core 
have these hooks, these four critical steps. So every hook, every habit starts with the trigger phase. Uh, Triggers come in two types. We have our external triggers, which are things in our environment that tell us what to do next. For example, uh, click here or buy now or play this YouTube video. All examples of triggers, right? The information is in the trigger itself. Those are external triggers. Mm-hmm. Now, internal triggers are something that people don't think about that much in the in the in the uh, entrepreneurial and design community, but turn out to be extremely important. Internal triggers are things that tell us what to do next, but where the information for what to do is in the user's head. Okay, and these tend to be emotions. In particular, they are negative emotions. So what we do when we're feeling bored or lonesome or lost or hungry or dissatisfied or fatigued, what we do when we experience these negative emotions prompts us to action with little or no conscious thought. So what all habit-forming products do is attach to a pain. They attach themselves to an itch so that instantly when you're feeling lonely, you're on Facebook. When you're unsure, you're on Google. When you're bored, you're checking YouTube or Reddit or stock prices or the news. They all fundamentally attach to these internal triggers so that eventually through using this product, you don't need any more external triggers, right? You don't go to Facebook just because you've got a notification. You go to Facebook because you're seeking connection, you're bored, you're experiencing FOMO, right? The fear of missing out. It's these Mm -hmm. internal triggers that eventually once these products can attach to those internal triggers, it's over. They have a monopoly of the mind. So that's the trigger phase. Is this where we learn about our deepest habit? Is this where addiction is formed, is in this trigger phase? Well, so addiction is is a is a whole nother topic and a fascinating topic, um, but it's it's different because uh, you know there's a reason I didn't call the book "How to Build Addictive Products." The book is called "How to Build (laughs) Habit Forming Products" because addiction is always bad. Addiction is a persistent compulsive dependency on a behavior or substance that hurts the user. So it's something that the user is harmed by wants to stop, but can't. That's the definition of an addiction. And people kind of throw that word around addiction, but it's really doesn't, you know, it doesn't qualify as, a def- as the technical definition of addiction unless it hurts you and you want to stop, but you can't. A big part of our emotional health comes from how we feel in our body and how satiated we are throughout the day. I mean, it's hard to treat other people well and think good thoughts if you're walking around hangry. One of the best ways to cure satiety and satiation is to add in powdered collagen to your drinks, your waters, and into your foods. I use Perfect Supplements Collagen. It's sourced from 100% grass-fed cows. That means there's no hormones, pesticides, or synthetics because these are healthy cows that eat grass while the sick cows eat corn. So beyond these healing powers of collagen for digestion and joint health, it also has 20 grams of protein in two scoops, which helps to curb appetite and increase that satiety. One of the cool things about this collagen is that there's individual packets you can mix in water and you know what it tastes like? Water. I mean, all of a sudden my glass has 10 grams, 20 grams of protein and all the health benefits of having this non-GMO pasture-raised collagen in my bloodstream. So don't walk around hangry. Pick up your grass-fed collagen. Feel better in your emotional body and your physical body every day. It's part of the Wellness Force Radio Bundle, and it's heavily discounted just for you. Click over to perfectsupplements.com slash wellnessforce to save 10% off the already discounted package and get more wellness in the process. Prepare to get your brain fed high octane with our next clip. Daniel Schmachtenberger, co-founder of the Neurohacker Collective, shares far beyond how a nootropic like Qualia can provide comprehensive hardware upgrades for radical cognitive enhancement and emotional resilience, but also why he believes it creates the building blocks towards a better planet. Daniel is brilliant. He shares his mind and his expertise of the body and brain systems to teach us the why, how, and what of these cognitive enhancers can really do for the health and speed of our mind. This was one of my all-time favorite episodes. I recorded it in person for the podcast where I shared my N equals one experiment from CES Las Vegas using nootropics, using qualia. So be sure to download episode 96 for the full story with Daniel. For people that don't know before I tell my story, what are nootropics? I mean, there's a buzz out there. The wellness industry, it's like one of the top seven trends or 10 trends right now for people that want to optimize the way they show up in their life. But if somebody hasn't heard of nootropics, I mean, what is a nootropic? So the word nootropic is not um, precisely defined in a way that uh, everyone uses it uh, commonly. But for the most part, we can define nootropic as some chemical that enhances some aspect of cognitive ability beyond normal baseline without meaningful side effects. 
And so if we're if we're dealing with someone's cognitive capability having dropped below baseline, we're dealing with pathology of some kind, even if it's subclinical pathology, right? Alzheimer's is cognitive decline from a pathology that we've uh, defined very clearly. Uh, brain fog is generally not a clearly defined pathology, but it is actually dysfunction. So if we are correcting the underlying dysfunction to just come back to baseline, that's very meaningful. We would call that kind of medicine in the psychoneuropharmacology and the you know cognitive chemistry space. And it's not medicine that's well understood or well defined, but that wouldn't be nootropics per se, even though a lot of people use nootropics for that space. Nootropics are really looking at optimization beyond baseline. How can I take some capacity and enhance it? Now, then you have smart drugs. So people who use Adderall not for prescription purposes for an actual diagnosed dysfunction, but are using it for enhancement, and it will enhance something. Whether it's Adderall that they're using or Ritalin or Modafinil or Wellbutrin or just lots of Red Bull. Red Bull is a smart drug. You could, you could think yeah. of it that way, right? Most of the time when we think smart drug, we think pharmaceuticals. Some pharmaceutical that's usually for narcolepsy or ADD or some other kind of uh, actual cognitive decline disorder like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. People will use levodopa, right, as a Parkinson's med for increasing dopamine, to different things like that. So we usually think of some kind of uh, pharma med for sm- that is being used for an off-label purpose for enhancing some aspect of cognitive function. And that does work, but usually it works at the cost of both long-term dependency, long-term side effects, and usually even fairly narrow upregulation with some real-time downregulation. So when people are taking dopamine, for instance, they're seeking to increase dopamine production, but they're not looking at how natural dopamine production and dopamine regulation works. And so we don't want dopamine relatively fixed from outside stimulus. We want dopamine to be able to be adaptive to external stimulus as is appropriate and adaptive to all of the other chemicals that it exists in quite complex relationships with, with serotonin, with GABA, with the other catecholamines, right? And we also want to look at the whole chain of how dopamine is produced to say, if that chain is damaged somewhere, right, the person is not getting enough tyrosine or uh, phenylalanine or they don't have enough of the vitamins that are involved in converting it B6 or C or et cetera, then that can affect other things. So dopamine might be the most obvious, but if it's a tyrosine issue, it might be affecting thyroid function. Right? So not only do we not want to just go straight to the in-chain chemical and make them not adaptive, but we don't want to lose the opportunity to optimize the entire chain for all of those purposes. And so smart drugs are not nootropics, though they're people who are interested are oftentimes interested in both. What we're interested in in the nootropic space, and we specifically have an approach to nootropics that is a, a complex system informed approach to nootropics, is how do we optimize some aspects of cognitive psychological function sustainably? where we don't have meaningful side effects in real time, like Adderall increasing focus but creating irritability or anxiety. And also addictive properties as well, right? That would be a long-term downside. The short-term downside would be being anxious or irritable while you're on it or having empathy go down or having digit span go down while focus goes up. So our goal, when we saw Adderall doing something like multi-billion dollar sales off-label, right, off-label purposes for people doing their tech startup or midterms or finals or with all the consequences associated, and we saw this exponential curve, and not just on that, but on a lot of smart drugs and on a $15 billion energy drink uh, market. And it's clear that people have radically increased demands on their cognitive ability. We are slaves right now to notifications. Calendar is being chocked full. I look at my brother's life. I love my brother. He has three kids and he has a full-time job and he's doing all these things. And I, and I look at him at the end of the day and he's drinking coffee and I'm like, there's got to be a better way because he is a mirror of the consciousness level and of the aptitude that's out there right now about people not really knowing what they can do to let some steam off and to refocus their attention. So I had an experience that I want to share and it was six weeks. Your company was nice enough to give me a great supply and it was incredible. I took a black label product, which is not on the market yet. But what happened is that I woke up in the morning, I did my meditation, I went through my normal process and then I'm at CES, eight podcast interviews in one day and going on stage to moderate a panel, and an after party. And at the end of the day, I was still thinking like, wow, I could actually connect with more people. And never in my life have I been able to be so focused, in the same way that I'm feeling you right now, where I'm fully present, I'm looking in someone's eyes, there's no response in me where I need to look away or check my phone or not be here. And that's something that's unique. 
So beyond just the physical energy that I was feeling, I mean, what is that product? Tell us about Qualia. Tell us what I was using to be able to have that incredible day. So the first thing that we looked at was, you know, as we were saying, we see this exponential rise in products that people are taking to enhance some aspect of productive capability or focus or energy or clarity, even if it is down-regulating other things that matter, even if it's causing dependence because the demand is so high, right? The need is so high. So as you're mentioning with your brother and so many people, there are more things causing distraction and competing for focus while an increased demand for productivity. And the net result of those together is very stressful, debilitating, et cetera. So most people know if they take caffeine, they can have increase in certain kinds of focus. But if they take it above a certain level, they're going to get then downsides, anxiety, jitters. And they still, if they actually pay attention and say they use Quantified Mind or Cambridge Online Cognitive Assessment or tools like that, Quantified Self Tools, they'll see that some metrics of cognitive capability increase and other ones actually decrease in real time, right? So we've seen times where people have a lot more energy, but they're actually task switching so fast that their follow through is poor or things like that, right? So the first thing we did was we said, all right, so people who are buying uh, off-label Adderall or smart drinks or whatever it is, what are they actually really looking for? And what they're looking for most of the time is not just increased arithmetic processing or increased verbal fluency or increased digit span, but they're looking for creative productive flow states where their cognitive capacities and their creative capacities are fully online and they have the right emotional state that goes along with that. So cognitively, there's a whole set of functions. It's short-term memory and long-term memory and speed of memory and digit span and verbal fluency and task switching and uh, depth of focus and attention span, right? It's all these classic cognitive metrics, but it's the product of those together, right? None of them on their own. And we actually really want to look at how do we lift all those together along with more internal drive and internal agency and more emotional resilience to disruptive external you know, phenomena. Creating almost a, a virtual buffer around distraction and things that want to pull you out of that state, whether it be flow state or just, or just focused attention. Exactly. This next clip is where we trust our process. Lisa Perkins, my friend and nutrition expert, is uncovering exactly how we can trust ourselves when it comes to food by using intuition, time, and focused attention. Lisa shares about how when it comes to nutrition, rules minus relationship equals rebellion. When we impose rules on ourselves without first trusting the promises we make to our body about nourishing it, it's going to end in rebellion. She believes that easy is earned. In the beginning of any nutrition program, she'll talk about paying attention to ourselves like if we were learning any new skill. Lisa not only has the science and accreditation background as a precision nutrition coach, but she also has a heart of gold. Click on episode 85 for the full show with Lisa. Eyes on your own plate, eyes on your own plan, eyes on your own body, and eyes on your own goal. When we start looking around at what everyone else is doing, oh, well, maybe keto or maybe low carb or maybe it's this plan or a juice fast, stop, come back, trust that your body's going to tell you what it needs and it will mm -hmm. tell you, but you need to give it some time and pay attention. Yeah, the pay attention piece is hard, though. The pay attention piece is the one where that's not popular because oh. a lot of people want this, Lisa. Haven't you found that a lot of people that, that have come to me or even write me emails, and I'm sure you work with, if they have the guide and if they have the plan, as long as they follow the guide to perfection, everything will work out. But it couldn't be more false because the very reason that they want to depend on a guide or a plan and, and Dr. J. Tita talked about this, right? Everyone's looking for the plan because then they can trust the plan. But the fact that they're so stringent about the plan and they wouldn't do it if the plan wasn't there doesn't give them very much emotional freedom to feel what really works. One of the things um, that I've learned is rules minus relationship equals rebellion. So what does that mean? When we impose rules upon ourselves, either from an external plan or just rules that we're putting on ourselves. If we don't have a solid relationship with ourselves, that trust that we're going to nourish ourselves, that we know that we're going to follow through on what we said that we would do. If that's kind of a sketchy relationship there, that's going to end in rebellion almost every time. So you've got to reestablish that relationship in order for those rules to adhere. I mean, you know, you've done it. I've done it. 
I'm I, laughing. Yeah, yeah. I am a rebel for sure. And I'm mm-hmm. always trying to kind of circumvent that inner toddler that's saying, well, don't be telling me I can't have that cookie. Then I have to be aware. Hey, nobody's imposing this upon me. This is a goal. I want a bigger life than this. A cookie is not meeting my needs. Yeah. You know, that's, that's blunting the process. So the last thing that I wanted to say in terms of figuring out your own plan And most people don't believe me in the beginning, but easy is earned. And yes, you do have to pay attention to some of these things. Just like when you're learning any new skill, when you're learning to drive, my foot's on the brake, my foot's on the pedal. Okay, where does 10 o'clock and two o'clock, you know, you are, you know, looking down at the, you know, am I following the speed limit? You know, you're, you're, that becomes intuitive over time. Yeah. Same with food. I would never have believed that at this point in my life that this would be in its own lane in its life. Food took center stage. It's not that I was doing it right, but it subsumed so much of my brain power for so many years of my life. It's really sad. I think of all of the things that I could have been doing when I was busy writing all these plans and how many calories is this and what could I possibly have later. And even while I was eating a meal, I was thinking, okay, when do I get to eat next? And what will that be? And if I eat then, then will I get to eat later? And will I get to have popcorn at the movie? My goodness. This is your ticket out of that. What happens in your physical body when you hear the word money? Do you get loose or get tight? Our next clip is with Ryan Yacomi, an internationally recognized expert in the field of personal transformation. He's the CEO of Money and Miracles Breakthrough Coaching. And essentially, Ryan believes that money just an exchange of energy. The challenge comes when we have an unhealthy relationship with our energy around money that can deflect it. Ryan has an extraordinary presence. You will feel it in this clip. He shares about how a lack of expression as a teen blocked his physical and financial wellness as an adult and the stages of work he went through to overcome the block to call in that money and the health he'd always been working for. Set your player for a download on episode 79 to hear the full show with Ryan. We run into a challenge because there are three different parts, but we're in one, and they usually want different things. So it's about getting them all in alignment. Sometimes what your body wants, you know, when it wants to go for the ice cream or it wants to go for the cookies, you know, your mind might be telling you no, or vice versa, or your soul might be telling you no, but your body's going, your biological chemicals are being released, and you're like, ah, but I want that cookie. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes there's that challenge of, of we got to get them all in alignment. So when you get them in alignment, that's when you start to get in flow when your body and your mind and your soul is all aligned. But here's, here's the deal with, with that. The hardest thing I personally believe to change is the mind because we have so many uncontrolled thoughts and, and kind of like by default, we'll go to fear. So we're just sort of hardwired for fear that, I mean, if you go all the way back, that's back in the day so we don't get eaten by a saber-toothed tiger, right? Mm-hmm. But we don't, have that, we don't have that problem anymore. But now we're very addicted to worry. We're very addicted to doubts, uncertainty. And so the hardest thing that I believe is the mind. So the body, we can get into you know, physical shape. You can eat clean and whatnot and you know, obviously go into your emotions. And then the soul, everyone who's listening to this, yourself included, Josh, I mean, we pretty much know what we want out of life. We know what our soul's telling us intuitively. But the mind, oh man, attitude, right? It's like, mm. let me work on that piece. Yeah. So, so that was the biggest thing that I had to work on that started to get me into flow. And the, and the hardest thing that I had a challenge with was two, two things. One was expressing myself and two was receiving. So I grew up, um, obviously my last name's Yukomi. So I'm half Japanese. So my father's Japanese and my mother's, you know, Canadian. She's, I don't know, Caucasian. She's white <laughs> and uh, whatever you want to call it. Right. And, um, so I grew up in a really strict household where we really didn't talk about emotions. We didn't express them. And it wasn't that I grew up in a bad environment. My parents were very loving, but that was the culture. And so we would sit at the dinner table and we really wouldn't talk because it was considered rude in the Japanese culture. And so I grew up having a very hard time with that because like, you know, like we were talking about earlier, I'm a very curious person. Like, I want to know why there's stars when I look up at night. Mm-hmm. I, I want to know why, you know, there's trees that are growing outside of my window right now. Like, I want to know why some people have money and some people don't. And, you know, what's the difference between their mindsets? I, I, I'm always curious. And that curiosity kind of got me in trouble growing up because I would be curious and then, you know, I, I kind of got it shut down. And so what happened with me is uh, I would always get sore throats. 
like, like consistently once or twice a month, I'd have like the worst sore throats. And I was always taking time off school. I was always sick. And it all comes, comes down. And what I learned later is that if you find yourself um, having a problem expressing who you truly are, expressing um, your truth, you'll block your throat chakra. And wow. then it'll, it will usually lead to disease of, you know, you're, you're actually getting a sore throat or strep throat. When did you make that connection? I mean, when did that connect for you? Oh, that, wasn't, that wasn't until like three or four years ago, hmm. not growing up at all. And so I couldn't, I couldn't figure this out and I, I, I would shut myself down. So I had a really hard time from that receiving um, the beauty and the miracles in life and receiving anything. And so, you know, I went through life and I actually was between the ages of, when was it? Grades four and five uh, are when I was being bullied a lot because I went into the school system and I just feel like I couldn't stand up for myself because I couldn't express myself because my throat chakra was so blocked. Uh. And so I would get into school and, you know, I couldn't stand up for myself. I didn't know what to do. And so I just wouldn't say anything. And then I got bullied quite a bit. And I remember in grade four being so um, connected to myself as far as like who I was and whatnot. And then grade five, I really shut everything down. And it was terrible. And uh, I did really poor in school and, and all these things were coming up for me. And so um, I had to go through this process of, of one, starting to learn how to be okay and feel safe to express myself. And two, starting to understand that um, I can receive other people. I can receive the gifts from the universe. I can receive money. And uh, that's what really started to change for me. That's how I started to get into flow. Our last clip is with a man who needs no introduction, health and human behavior specialist, Dan Party. Dan's return to Wellness Force is shining light on how we can use what he calls human OS to cut through the noise of the overwhelming information online so we can really find the health we're looking for. Dan's mission and his systems of finding the right answers in our body, mind, and spirit were so profound, we put his voice in our show intro. So in this final clip, Dan shares why no matter how much we know, it won't always inspire us to take the right actions. Knowing without doing is the same thing as not knowing. What matters is if the knowledge you have will give you an effective health practice for the long term. Dan is one of my most trusted sources for wellness, so you'll want to download episode 88 for later. So as you say, there's a lot of information out there. And if somebody's really interested, then what is a common problem that we face? Well, people will oftentimes trend hop. What do I mean by that? Well, their health practice right now, and what I mean by health practice is the sequence of activities that somebody is actually engaging in to try to be healthy is determined by the last thing that they read or something that they read recently. And we know that the journalistic incentives are oftentimes more about clicks than clarity, right? And it's not trying to, you know, blame some, you know, somebody else for your health issues, but it's true, right? So oftentimes a result of somebody who's interested is that, gosh, this stuff is just so confusing because I read one thing one day that said this, and then the next day I read something else that said that. And yeah. the fact of the matter is that if you were to plot on a graph you know, let's say research in one area, you would see there would be a scatter plot. There'd be information all over the graph. What you really want to do is try to figure out what is that trend line that goes right through all of the the range of data because, you know, the trend line is what is is what you actually care about. Is like, hey, is this thing going in the good direction or the bad direction? Because you can paint a very interesting picture by looking at the three studies out of twenty five that say the opposite. Than the other than the rest of the twenty two, right? And hey, gosh, if you only heard about those three studies, it would seem really convincing. So that is really the the the, the issue that is placed on people's shoulders when they're trying to figure out something around for their health on a certain topic. Who has time to go through all of that information, yeah. or, and maybe even have the skill to read scientific information, uh, you know, in the right way? And I thought to myself, this is a problem that we can solve. We can get the right people that have the right backgrounds to do this, to then create a method by which we analyze information uh, and then present it to people in a manner that is almost like an executive summary of what the the main theme of the research tells us, the preponderance of the evidence tells us. And to do so in a manner that helps people retain the information even greater than if they read a book. Much better, in fact. Mm -hmm. So six months after, if you know, you've taken a, let's say, a, a course, which is what we're creating, then you would be able to tell a friend who asked, uh, tell me about fasting. And you took the fasting course and then be able to do that. And the better that they are able to do that, the better they are able to benefit from that information in their life. 
And that is our goal. That's our goal is to do a lot of the work for people, present it to them in a manner that helps them learn and even speak to it. And think about that. So you could spend even more time reading a bunch of articles on on fasting and listening to even podcasts, et cetera. Yeah. And, and I just chose that topic randomly, but let's use it. And you might not still be benefiting from it, where if you are actually walked through the information in a, in a better manner, then you could have a skill that could, you could benefit from the rest, for the rest of your life, for the rest of your life. Yeah. And that's really exciting to me that a little bit of effort spent by the interested person can benefit them, you know, forever. And then I think that's where tweets, podcasts, blogs, you know, uh, can actually come into play. They can be reminders, but I think that they're insufficient as educational tools overall. They can actually help you understand that a topic might be interesting, but they're oftentimes insufficient to get you to a place where you really know the information well enough to benefit from it. You've arrived at the end of the show, but it's all good. There are hundreds more episodes to pull energy and inspiration from on your phone that'll last you for many, many weeks. And regardless of our prize giveaway, you don't have to sign up. I have a lot more free stuff for you this week. Seriously, these prizes are insanely good though. I handpicked them from all the things that I honestly go nuts for. So leave your quick iTunes review for the show right now from your phone. Just click on the show artwork and screen. Touch that review word in caps in purple. You can also click over to wellnessforce.com forward slash 100. Claim your spot to win. You're not signing up for anything. You're just getting free stuff that's going to help you have greater wellness. Okay, so more of the free stuff I was talking about. I want to invite you to sign up for our community newsletter. It's at wellnessforce.com forward slash news. Whether you want the awesome prizes or not, I'm giving you three free guides this month for better wellness. The first one is seven devices that I believe will allow people to live more mindfully using these wellness devices. Our second guide is five technology devices that you can use to gain muscle. If you're training in the gym or if you're on a training program right now, this guide is going to help you out quite a bit. And lastly, for all of us that travel, I want to throw in a guide for how to stay healthy when you're traveling. So all three of those guides you'll receive when you sign up for the Wellness Force Community newsletter. I also want to thank so many people who have helped these past 100 episodes happen. Now, there's not another hour for me or time to list everyone who's made this podcast possible. So I know I'm going to miss a ton of people, but special shout outs to Buzzy Torek and the entire team over at Epicast Network for making the show audio so great. To Perfect Supplements for believing in us and supporting this show with trustworthy and amazing products. To my brother James for being the example of how to live life from the heart to Amy Dalton for opening my eyes and my world and my soul to what's possible in a relationship, to my mom and dad for giving me this gift of life, to my teachers, Watts, Hill, Brown, Hicks, Sagan, Silva, Tita, both alive and gone for all you've given me, all the powerful guests that we've had on this show, thank you. And last but not least, my warriors in the wellness community, I see you, I love you, and I support what you're doing to raise this consciousness and wellness that the world needs so much right now. I literally cannot wait. I'm jumping out of my skin to announce the winners of the prize packs March 14th. I also can't wait to meet you in person at an event or online this year as Wellness Force grows. My birthday is coming up fast approaching April 29th. I'm doing the Seal Fit 20X at Vail Lake Resort here outside San Diego. If you want to join me, Write to me, Josh, at wellnessforce.com with the subject line 20X. And my friend, I know you already know this, but thank you for being here. Thank you for being a part of this community who are up to big things and doing the physical and emotional work needed to live our life well. So until I see you again real soon, I'm wishing you love and wellness.